pictures of the B-29 Super Fortress, the biggest, fastest bombing plane in the world. Within two weeks following Allied landings in France, and one day after Allied landings at Saipan, 1,500 miles from Tokyo, a force of these flying dreadnoughts took off from an unnamed base in China. They struck at Yawata, the center of one-fifth of Japanese steel production. So powerful is this new giant of the skies that a worldwide aerial organization, the 20th Air Force, will operate the super fortresses under the command of the combined chiefs of staff. In order to reach their bases in China, the planes flew from India across the hump over dread Himalayan peaks towering 20,000 feet into the air. Here in the clouds, at the last stop before Kunming, China, engineers of the Chinese army have set up landing strips. The almost complete lack of modern equipment has not stopped the Chinese in the crucial job of constructing these airfields. Dwarfing the mighty fortress and liberator to medium bomber status, the 8,800 horsepower Super Fortress is a global weapon for global warfare. The Allied Fifth Army sweeps forward on the roads to Rome. In swift, staggering blows from both the casino and beachhead sectors, General Mark Clark's forces within less than four weeks have closed into the very outskirts of the Eternal City. Fifth Army battle equipment, assembled in great quantities for this climatic thrust, moves up fast. In the opposite direction go German prisoners to Allied detention camps, part of the 21,000 taken captive in 25 days. The total Nazi casualties in this drive alone have been greater than those of the Allies during the entire Italian campaign. American tanks, after outflanking enemy strong points in the Alban Hills, approach the entrances to Rome. Here, German rear guards made a final stand. Just before the Nazis fell rapidly back, General Clark conferred with his staff and ordered an attack. Leaving this area, General Clark narrowly escaped enemy fire. German guns open up immediately. Shells fall on tanks and men in the road. Infantry presses in toward Rome from the city suburbs. The first groups of civilians welcome the Americans. sharp fight preceding the German withdrawal, in order to save their outmaneuvered army, some American armored units are destroyed. Italian civilian fighters in action behind Nazi lines for months have seized German prisoners. They turn them over to regular Fifth Army forces. More citizens turn out to greet the Yanks as now in formal order they pour through the gates into the ancient city. to fall to Allied armies of liberation is now officially occupied. The Roman populace begins to gather in a joyful reception.
United States, British, and Italian flags fly as in the heart of Rome, General Clark and his commanders take control. Major General Grunther, French General Juin, Major General Truscott, Major General Keyes, General Mark Clark. Led by a military band, citizens of Rome organized welcoming ceremonies. After more than 20 years of fascism, they are free again. Romans tear down anti-allied propaganda cartoons posted by the Germans. A former fascist official is taken through the streets under arrest. The crowd show their contempt. A grenade explodes in fascist police headquarters in the city. Mussolini's dreaded secret police had collaborated with the Nazis up to the liberation. From a balcony made famous by Mussolini, U.S. Sergeant John Vita imitates Il Duce before laughing crowds. Fifth Army moves on in rapid pursuit of the enemy. Only necessary holding units are left in the city. But in Rome, eternal city, the Vatican bells of St. Peter's ring in peace. A huge crowd masses in the Vatican Plaza to hear Pope Pius XII speaking to Italians and Allied troops the day following Rome's liberation. 250,000 fill the square, a momentous occasion a symbol of the thanks which all free peoples feel for the deliverance of a great and historic city.